Uh, uh. Uh. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining uh, today's session on global expansion, especially in Southeast Asia. My name is Takia. I'm working for an education company called Quipa. So today, we only have uh, 20 minutes, so uh, we don't have much time. So uh, we can start by uh, quickly introducing ourselves. So maybe Max, you can start. OK, hi. Uh, my name is Max from Stock Traders. What we are doing, we do the stock trading platform. And now we just move into the cryptocurrency. We just do ICO called Carbonium. We are the team behind uh, more than 5 million users, it based in, mainly based in Thailand. And uh, we start to expand to Indonesia and Singapore. Yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I'm Richard Pan. Uh, most people know me by AIM. Uh, I started Thailand's first co-working space, uh, Haba. It's going to be in five locations based in Bangkok. But regionally, uh, I'm also one of the co-founders of TechSauce. Uh, we are a tech media and conference company. Uh, that covers both Thailand and Southeast Asia. Uh, we also do roadshow and events to over si 20 cities across the world. We cover almost all cities in Southeast Asia and are uh, very active and have talked to all the ecosystem builders in every country and learned about all their uh, challenges and the great opportunities in the region. All right, thank you. Uh, I prepared my slides, so bear with me. Um, Okay, so Quipa uh, was founded in 2010 uh, in the UK, and then we currently have five offices in London, Tokyo, Manila, Mexico City, and Jakarta. We have about 500, uh, sorry, 800 members, and we got acquired by Recruit in 2015. A uh, little bit about myself, I went to Todai, and then I dropped out and went to UCL, and then joined Quipa as a founding member in 2011, and now leading Indonesia's uh, operation with uh, more than 500 members. And I'm doing in angel investment and also advising uh, local VCs in the region. Uh, Kuipa is uh, providing two services, one study supply in Japan and then Kuipa in other countries. We have more than 700,000 paying customers uh, all over the world uh, with study supply and then Kuipa combined, uh, used in more than uh, thousands of schools. And these are happy students and teachers. Our, our mission is to solve the education gap, offer learning opportunities to uh, lots of students and maximize the power of education, uh, power of technologies to in innovate education. Okay, so very quick introduction. Uh, with a show of hands, who is currently doing business in Southeast Asia or who is thinking about uh, doing business in Southeast Asia in the audience? Can you raise your hand if you are doing something already in Southeast Asia? Okay, great. All right, so today uh, we want to talk about uh, the interesting trends happening in Southeast Asia. We believe Southeast Asia is going to be the next China in five years. It's a very, very big and then promising market. And um, also, some of the challenges that we are facing as a local player, as well as uh, players coming from outside of Southeast Asia. OK, so maybe we can start by uh, asking uh, some of the interesting trends happening in Southeast Asia. Sure, so um, from my read uh, through Arrocha in Texas uh, is that the region, despite all the hype around uh, being 600 million people and one of the fastest growing region in the world, it is still, even till this day, six years in into the tech space, a very local game. It's still fragmented in terms of different cultures and languages, ways of doing businesses, and the whole pan Southeast Asian dream of um, deregulating and making it uh, easy to conduct business across the region is still in progress and is not quite there yet. So that is, I think, uh, one of the, the biggest challenges that we still see. However, the, one of the biggest opportunities and trends that we're seeing is that in the past, all of our startups in Southeast Asia were very focused um, in, in their own home market. Now, what we're seeing is not only companies trying to scale out of their home markets, especially into Indonesia, but also many companies from across the world, uh, you name it, the biggest uh, tech companies are trying to get into the region. In the past, they would have ignored it as a very painful problem, trying to conquer 10 countries and go very slow. Now the opportunity is big enough to say that uh, that is a problem worth solving or that is a problem worth tackling because the, the economics make sense. 
Right, Max, you're based in Thailand. Do you have yep. any views from uh, Thailand? Uh, for, for Thailand ourselves, uh, culture is a bit different from, from other countries. Um, Southeast Asia itself is really fragmented, as Em said, and uh, language-wise, religious, and even the application that we use. Um, for Thai people, we, we use a lot of line, just like in Japan. I think there, there is only like three major countries for line in, in like the whole world. So whenever we, we do some uh, approach to, to the customer, we always need a channel that local use. For example, for us, what, what we have done with Stock Raider and also the, the ICO that we are doing, we just do the KYC online uh, for the first time in the world that, that we use KYC online. Why don't we just use on the web? Because online is a lot easier, on, it's a lot faster for people. Just, you know, like just get into the live official account, got the rich menu and just touch and upload some folder. Which is, if I want to do exactly the same thing in, for example, Malaysia, I may not be able to do because they don't use line. So you may need to um, tackle a bit different for every single country in the Southeast Asia. And of course, um, the way that you approach them is also very different. For example, for the Thai culture, we are more likely to be very open and like playful. Like all those sticker, all those like uh, smiling character, brown, corny, all those stuff. But it may not work in other country, even in the Southeast Asia. Yeah. So if compared with other regions, Southeast Asia is considered as a lot more fragmented. I think be behind the stage, we were talking about one of the other, other major trends in terms of corporate startup partnerships. And uh, what we're seeing uh, is that some of the biggest companies in the region that we thought were dinosaurs or unsexy and cool, I'm starting to realize that uh, with the disruption that's happening with technologies, they're actually moving very fast uh, and now have come up with corporate venture arms and VCs and all that. And one of the, the great things in the region is uh, these are the largest families and largest companies in the, those their country with all the networks, all the TV channels and the property conglomerates and the distribution and marketing. And through strategic startup corporate partnerships, many of our tech companies in our country have grown way faster than many have imagined of raising private capital and going the whole Silicon Valley route. So that's been an interesting trend. And um, from a data point perspective in Thailand, we're expecting 60 of the largest 100 companies in Thailand to be involved in corporate startup partnership uh, this year. That's coming from 20 companies that we've uh, tracked about uh, last year. Right. Um so let me talk a little bit about Indonesia. Uh, we went to Indonesia in 2015, and then at the time when we say like you know Indonesia is or Southeast Asia is going to be the next China, no one believed it. <laughs> but now uh, a lot of capital is flowing into, uh, especially Indonesia. There are already maybe four unicorns in the country. Uh, one Gojek is a local uh, taxi hailing company which raised more than 1.2 billion. And then uh, Traveloka Travel Company is really making a lot of money. And then uh, Tokopedia raised a lot of money from uh, you know, Alibaba. Yeah. So a lot of China money is coming to uh, Southeast Asia, yeah. uh, making quite a lot of companies, uh, unicorn companies. And I think there are more unicorns in Southeast Asia or Indonesia than in Japan now. And that's really exciting. And then another trend is uh, we see that uh, the startup ecosystem has been growing really quickly as well. Uh, now there are many more exit opportunities, you know, M and A's. And then I'm not too sure about IPO, but there are many e exit opportunities for startups. So a lot of you know people want to join a startup, startup business. Uh, I see many previously working at consulting companies now joining startups, you know, because startups are very, very exciting. Now, a lot of people are now, you know, quitting the previous jobs to start a company. Yeah. So uh, this ecosystem, of course, you know, investors coming from not only from the region, but of course from Japan and then from the U.S., from Europe, many investment is uh, happening in Southeast Asia as well. And this change has happened, I think, in the, next, uh, in the last two, three years. So uh, I see a lot of opportunities now in Southeast Asia, and it's very, very exciting. 
Agreed, agreed. I mean, um, if I just moved to Indonesia, I think my valuation would go up three times. So I'm very, very keen to go there one day. Right, okay. So uh, let me ask you questions about the challenges that you're facing or uh, the companies in, in the region are facing right now, working with government or you know, like how to be successful in the region. Um, for me, the, I work in the fintech area, so uh, fintech always like the field that you need to work a lot more with the government, with the regulator, especially uh, when we do ICO right now, it seems like crazy. I, I would say like all those regulations keep moving all the time and a lot of rumors, a lot of all those like um, expectation from outside. So c currently we need to check on each country where whether is it allowed or not for the cryptocurrency fintech stuff. But the good part of, of on the new field like this is there is no boundary anymore. Most of people, I just back from Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong people also, most of the time we're talking about we should incorporate in Hong Kong or Singapore. But for themselves, they're also talking about SFC try to ban some ICO company. So now they all go to Cayman. So, so it's kind of... It's no matter anymore where, where we are, but our market is everywhere, so we can have the customer from everywhere. But of course, it's two sides of the coins. If you got the customer from everywhere, you also got the competitor from everywhere too. So this is something that we, we need to make sure that we improve ourselves enough and try to uh, basically cope up with, with their competition and also understand the market and under, understand the culture and then try to approach the people by by just try to uh, suit their unwilling need, need that, that uh, they don't even know yet that, that they need that kind of product or services by, by just study them more. Yeah, yeah. so um, one of the best advice I was given about which country should you start in Southeast Asia? It's all very exciting and, and beautiful and everyone is unique, uh, is trying to find where you have an unfair advantage. And one of the unfair advantage that's not often talked about is where can you recruit better, faster, and, and be more cost effective. And that actually is the challenge of Southeast Asia because the lack of talent or the extreme competition for high quality talent is so high because you have 20 banks in Thailand, for an example, and everybody's going through digital disruption all at the same time. And you have global companies, you have uh, you know, the, the F, uh, FAMGAs, you know, the Facebook and Googles. Then you have the regional companies, the Travelocas, the Agoda, uh, the Grab, and the local hot startups that have raised Series A, Series B, and then a bunch of other folks that um, want to strike it out on their own. So with a very sh short talent pool of uh, computer science and engineering graduates, and a very small pool of that, that actually are usable in all of our countries, maybe due to the lack of updated curriculum or education quality. And you have a very tiny, tiny group of people that are in so high demand. So one of the challenge and opportunities for people expanding the region is you need to find a unique pipeline that you can secure your talent, whether it's through partnerships with a local partner, a corporate or a co-working space or community builder, uh, working with universities, working with uh, different platforms, Equipper. The idea is you can build a great company that grows really fast without great talent. Yeah, I completely agree about the lack of uh, talent, especially the engineering computer science graduates. Uh, a lot of uh, big startups in Indonesia are developing from India, actually. Yeah, yeah. Because so they, they cannot find uh, enough number of talents in, in the country. Yeah, Gojek and uh, Gojek Grab is, uh, buying yeah, up companies. They, they, they are developing in India. And, uh, yep. yeah, so I think that's something that we need to uh, solve as soon as possible. And another point is, I think you mentioned, is Southeast Asia is very fragmented. So we tend to put you know, all the countries together, but each country is very different. And uh, I don't see many examples of, uh, you know, companies being successful in multiple countries in Southeast Asia. Do you see any examples? Uh, I, I guess the b best way to answer is uh, most of our ecosystems are very new. Everyone's a first time founder. Nobody's scaled uh, their companies abroad. Very few of the mentors have actually done it. So because of that lack of depth, like nobody has uh, 
IPO or gone to NASDAQ, then it's progressively taking us uh, more time. But you're seeing the case of Garena C, uh, IPO in NASDAQ. You're seeing uh, many cases uh, that are inspiring and also teaching the next generation the, the lessons and being the example. So, th so that's, uh, I think the, it's a process that all of us are going through. And uh, just stay tuned because I think you're going to see more of that in the future. You may want to share more about Grab and Uber case for Southeast Asia. Yeah, sure. I guess uh, in, in our, my working with uh, the Grab team since the day they launched in, in Thailand and uh, uh, perpetually being pinged on LinkedIn by recruiters at, at Uber. So I've seen the, the difference in the way that both have, have approached it and I think what you've seen is, you know, a small scrappy company in Southeast Asia beating a global giant that had more funding, uh, you know, have ubiquitous uh, branding that everybody has heard of and then used and tried, and being able to conquer and dominate and create a moat, a competitive moat around their, their region. I think one of the things that they did really well, and, uh, you know, this is really the hack, is Grab is a Malaysian company, reincorporated and then based in Singapore, but you know, started by a Malaysian guy. But when they came into Thailand, everybody thought it was a Thai company. And the, the reason for that is they didn't just hire any country manager, any country head who was just, you know, the sort of folks that uh, would love, love to get that branding, love to be that boss, but didn't actually do anything. They actually hired people that had the right networks, that were established as entrepreneurs on the ground and that they were able to not just uh, represent the brand but actually recruit a strong caliber and the quality of a team to assemble the initial uh, Grab Taxi team. And Kunjun, to her credit, has created such a great foundation that most people considered Grab to be very local and very Thai, despite that obviously it is not. So yeah, Grab Uber example is a very interesting one. Exactly. To uh, for local players beating global players, do you think it's going to happen in other areas as well? Like global players, would they be able to be successful in the region, or would local players always win in the market? I think there there is a lot more case. Um, maybe not in startup itself, but you may find that in many country, Starbucks is not that good when compared with local coffee shop. I think it is the same thing because it's just a matter of you if you understand people better. Um, all the business that we are doing here is all approach to people, not only from inside, but for the customer wise, our team and everyone. Everyone just uh, need to be treated well as, as they expected. And in each culture, um, we totally have a lot of different beliefs. For example, like in Thailand, we are Buddhist, right? So we believe in karma, so a bit more loyalty into, into the company. It may be not sound like related to the startup world, but actually it's the root of everything. So whenever you like, try to learn more about the people there in each country, so you treat them better, and everything will be like, a bit more sustained. And of course, uh, when, when talking about people, not only about talent, but customer, partner, and everyone inside the, inside the ecosystem, in Asia, we still believe that all, all the value from the relationship is a lot more important for people around. It's not like from the Western side of the world that more on the result base, right? So sometimes it, it more on understanding the culture is more on like touching with, with people hearts. And that, that is, I think, the main key of success for Southeast Asia. Yeah, I think my, my, my uh, comment on that and expanding on that uh, note, uh, Bruce Lee said it right, you know, it's, you know, empty your cup when you come into the region. A lot of global brands, regional brands, maybe even companies here from, from Japan feel that they're the biggest in the market, have a, a ton of funding, they're very well known globally, and they come into the region and they believe that because they are the unicorns and the biggest in the world, they're just going to do the same thing that they did in Silicon Valley, they did in Japan, and guess what, a lot of those things might not follow regulation. A lot of those things might upset a lot of uh, local, very influential players. And then that's when you run into problems. So you've seen this case here with Airbnb, and even they have to take a very 
local approach. And importantly, it is talking to regulators. If you're just keeping talking to lawyers, uh, what, what do lawyers do? They uh, keep, love to keep talking to you because they get paid to talk to you by the hour or by the minute. Now, a lot of regulators are very approachable. They want tech and startups and innovation and jobs in their country. And they're happy to understand what you're trying to do only if you follow the right protocol, be respectful to your host country, and be creating value for them. And if, if so, uh, then you'll actually know, you know all that you need to know about regulation and then tax and all that and save a ton of time and a ton of money down the line. I think the other part is, as Max mentioned earlier, localization. Um, the, the essence of understanding customer development in each market is so important. That is why when you uh, go to um, Southeast Asia and, and the app like Grab or you know, Line, they totally understand how Thai consumers think and Indonesian consumers think. And they will do offer things that nobody think uh, is useful. Say for an example, uh, buying airline tickets. Uh, we love to go and pay them at the convenience store and counter service. Being able to offer that kind of checkout experience that Thai consumers uh, like, they, they're used to it, uh, has, has made a world of difference. Uh, one of the biggest pain points that between Grab and Uber that I got was uh, with Uber, there's nobody to yell at when you have a problem. You only have to do that by email. That experience for most uh, Southeast Asian is very w weird to, to do customer complaints on text. They just want to pick up the phone and say, something's wrong with my ride. I, I need to talk to somebody. Right, thank you. So um, maybe the last point. Uh, we want to talk about the, uh, the tips on how to be successful in Southeast Asia, but we don't have much time. So let me share uh, from outsider's view about how we can be successful in Southeast Asia. One, as everyone mentioned, is localization is really the key. Uh, you know, we don't have a, a universal Southeast Asia strategy. You know, in each country, we have to have different people. We have to have different strategies. We have to talk to different people. We have to really differentiate our strategies based on the country. So localization is really the key. And the second part, as you mentioned, is the uh, still the digital economy is not really big enough. It's still premature. So for example, the payment system, uh, only 5% of the people have credit cards. So they cannot uh, pay you know, for stuff on using credit cards or uh, so everyone has to go to a convenience store or do the bank transfer. So uh, we need to be really patient for a little while to, you know, f to wait for the digital economy to grow a little bit more. And then, but before th this happens, face-to-face -face interactions, face-to-face -face communications, or like you know, having a good customer support, these kind of a more human you know, uh, approach would be very, very necessary. And then I think that's pretty important in Southeast Asia. I guess we already run out of time. So after this, we're going to have a, a Q&A session in the cafe. So please join if you are still interested. Uh, again, thank you very much, Max and Emma, for uh, very exciting uh, talks. And then thank you very much, audience, for joining today's session. All right. Thank you. Kabun Gap. Kabun Gap.